everyone. I'm Joanne. I'm an architect and a content marketing manager here at Monograph. We'll have Jenny Chastain, who is the founder of Apostrophe Consulting and Lynn Chalk as the manager director uh, with business management at Brick. Apostrophe at Consulting is a purpose-driven woman-owned management consulting practice dedicated to helping architects transform their companies. In that, in this session, Jenny and her client Lynn are going to be talking about how Brick, a mid-sized practice based in Oakland, California, redesigned and continued to evolve their studio to put communications at the heart of their business. Hi, <laughs> thanks for having us, Joanne. Thank you. We're excited to have you two here. Um, well, we are excited and we I'm delighted to have Brick here with me today. They've agreed to come forward as a case study on practice and share what they've been doing inside their studio. When Evelyn kicked off our opening keynote yesterday, she talked about the business opportunity to design solutions inside of your firm. And this session is going to be looking at the often overlooked topic of communication inside a studio and how that impacts both your team and your practice and the opportunity that you have to design solutions that support your practice. So I'm so pleased to welcome Lynn Chalk, who I've been working with over the last several months. Um, we've been working on a communications and mentorship program specifically de designed to support their team. And I thought Brick was an amazing firm to bring forward to the Section Cut community to introduce you to the work that they're doing and their leadership team. So the first portion of this presentation is going to be a case study specifically about what Brick's doing, about their growth over the past several years, and how they're designing solutions in the studio right now to address that growth. The second part of this presentation, we're going to dive into the topic of communications through the lens of actually mentorship and talk about how we're actually creating real-time solutions and we're going through this pilot project this year to help the, support the studio. We'll move into a Q&A and we'd love to hear your feedback and questions once we get to that point. Um, as Joanne mentioned, we have a poll. We have a couple questions in the sidebar. We'd love to hear your answers to those questions as we head into the Q&A. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it off to Lynn. Lynn, I'm so glad to have you here today. Thank you so much, Janine. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to participate. Thank you to Monograph for also having us. Um, this is very exciting and we're, I'm just really um, thrilled to be here and be able to talk about what we're doing at Brick. So as Janine mentioned, I'm going to kind of introduce where we are now as a firm, where, how we got here and where we're going and how we think communication is a vital tool to get us where we do wanna go in the future. So right now we are 34 full-time employees approaching 8 million in gross revenue. Our core office, our main office is located in downtown Oakland. We have just opened a new office in Boston, which we're very excited about. Um, as many people experienced <laughs> during COVID, one of our core um, employees decided to make a change and move back to their hometown. And we decided to capitalize on that as we felt there was good synergy between the markets in Boston and the markets in uh, the Bay Area. And we wanted to really see what we could do around that. As you'll see when we talk, as I talk throughout this presentation, one of our goals as a company is absolutely exponential growth. So our core markets are commercial office and life science, multifamily housing and higher education. And within those markets, we're executing core and shell work, interiors and repositioning. So kind of speaking to that Boston office and where the synergies occur, like where we are here, where we are in Boston, lots of life science work, the lots of synergies with the higher education. So we're very excited about where we're heading. And here's a shot of kind of the inception of Brick. In the middle is our CEO, Robert Zirkel. Um, to his right is Matthew Combrink, our other owner. And the other person on the left is the first employee. So very much humble beginnings. Brick started at Rob's kitchen table. 
And I think the inception of the firm also very similar to a lot of firms, two charismatic, very smart, creative architects working in large firms for most of their careers, deciding, hey, we want to do something a little different. We want to have a little more control over the work and also where we can see our futures going. So decided to break off, start their own firm and building what they could in the Bay Area. And like a lot of firms, you know, pretty sustainable, slow growth to a true kind of small firm in this picture. Very much high, you know, highly functioning generalists were the main employees at this time. Not a lot of diversification in, in experience, very flat um, hierarchy within the organization. Pretty much one person would work on one job and then Rob and Matt would touch everything and also be the main client facing participants in most of our transactions. And you can see a year later, all of a sudden, our firm's looking a bit different. We can still fit on the couch, it's getting a little harder, but we're also starting to see a more a range of experience. We have started to hire junior designers and kind of this is all driven by the scale of our projects also increasing. When 2017 came around, we started getting projects that actually required project teams, where previously we could kind of get away with the one person, maybe the two people working on a project. But now we really needed to lean into, okay, we need to work together, we need to bifurcate the work out to different people, and also figure out how Rob and Matt were going to still stay involved in the projects at different levels. And now we can no longer even fit on the couch. We have to start taking the picture somewhere else. And this is, at this moment, we're really realizing, hey, we have something special here. We have a lot of opportunity for growth, but are we organized a way that that is going to be successful for us? So we started to take some hard looks about how the company was organized, how are our teams organized, do we need to do something different, where can we go from here? And so in 2019, we decided let's put some work in and really create a strong foundation for where we wanna go. And we felt the main foundational pieces were to draft and create our shared values in our mission statement. So within creating our shared values, we approached it with many different communication skills and also Bigger Picture wanted to take advantage of the moment we were at. At this time, we had about 20 people. So it was a really an opportunity to allow everyone to speak to how they felt about these things, how they wanted to see the company moving and growing. And we really, like I said, wanted to hear from everyone. So we used lots of different tools around this, started with surveys, a lot of in-person meetings, both as a group, at large and also a lot of breakout sessions. This slide that we're showing um, highlights another tool that we use called Poll Everywhere, which is an anonymous app that we all use via our phones. And this was actually great because it allowed people to say how they felt without necessarily calling them out in front of everyone. And an interesting portion of determining and creating our values is we decided we wanted 100% agreement around the words slash ideas that we chose. Personally, I thought that was very ambitious. I wasn't sure we could achieve that, but we did, which was very satisfying and exciting. I will say, just because we had 100% agreement didn't mean we had 100% enthusiasm necessarily around the process. So not everyone was on board with, oh, this is such a great idea. I really want to do kind of this more, I don't want to call it touchy-feely, but just like digging in to our core ideas as a company. Um, but regardless of level of enthusiasm, there was something very impactful about everyone participating and being on board and feeling that they had an opportunity to speak to what we were trying to do. And I do wanna speak also just really quickly on using all those tools. We really want to give opportunity for people who don't like to speak up in front of a large group, who don't feel comfortable doing that, 
because it every idea is important and every person's opinion that is we want to value but that doesn't mean everyone feels comfortable speaking in front of a group even in front of a like small breakout group so we really want to give like multiple opportunities to lean into how people want to express their ideas so here are our values that we are created and we feel very strongly that this was a great outcome because we have used these words ideas to drive all parts of our business we are these are the attributes that we judge people on during their evaluations we've taken these words and kind of crafted them within a performance evaluation context we also use these words when we're trying to choose what projects do we want to go for what clients do we want to work with who are the people we want to hire and are going to work well within our culture so within all contexts we're able to use these values to really drive our decision making which was the goal and it's nice to see it's been achieved. So within, after the values, we decided, okay, let's tackle our mission statement. We approach this a bit differently, still lots of different ways to collaborate, let our ideas be known, but we did a lot of research before we even started this particular exercise because we wanted to see what's happening out there in the AAC industry. What's happening with mission statements for businesses at large? Do they feel impactful or do they feel throwaway? Because we felt very strongly we wanted our mission statement to be sincere, be something we could really feel proud to reference. And it really can drive our decisions within like what we're doing as a business. So our final mission statement was and is outsmart convention, create value, design like you mean it. And these three phases, phrases really speak to how we approach business. Outsmart convention. We are always trying to deliver the highest level design in the most creative way, but we wanna make sure, are we questioning? Are we doing something different? Are we putting something lasting out there into the community in the context of the communities we work in. Creating value is a huge part of what we are partnering with our clients around. We feel very proud and about, we are constantly trying to return, uh, return on investment to our clients. So like I said, it's not just about the design, it's making sure everyone is hitting all their metrics on every side. So if the pro forma, the pro forma needs to work out for our clients and we are trying to help them actualize that as much as possible and then design like you mean it mean it like i said we are in a very unique and special industry where what we create has lasting impact so we want to think a lot about what are we doing we don't want to put throwaway buildings into cities communities you know, even our nation we want to make sure what we're doing is important that people like it it creates an opportunity for people to gather and feel inclusive, not create buildings that sim somehow add boundaries to our communities. We want the opposite. So we're feeling good uh, at the end of 2019. We feel really great about our collaboration, honestly, about our communication at this moment. We've really created the frameworks that we can see our company growing within. We're, we're all in. We decide we're going to really invest in ourselves now. We're ready to take this leap. At this time, we've decided we're going to get a new office. We are going to move from, we were in located in Emeryville. We're going to kind of level up to downtown Oakland, create um, opportunities for to expand our employee base potentially, be closer to transit. We're just like, yep, we're ready to hit the ground running. So about this time, we also realized, okay, if we want to exponentially grow, we do need to show people how can this happen. So our CEO kind of went off into his secret laboratory, did a lot of research himself, not just on the AAC industry, but once again, business at large. What, is the, what are the frameworks, the structures that we can build to see the path forward? So he came back with and introduced to leadership uh, this idea of our new org chart. 
to not only show how we can grow our company exponentially, but also to show our employees, we have a path for you. We want you here long-term. And how can we achieve that? How can you achieve your career goals here with Brick and not have to go somewhere else to see what you maybe want and or need for the future of your career? So leadership, everyone, we all are excited by this idea. We buy in, we roll it out. We're thinking, hey, this is amazing. <laughs> we move into our new office at the beginning of 2020, um, which was a little bit late. We were actually hoping to move into the office and then bring in the org chart, but they happened a little bit in opposite order, but we're very excited. Here we are, like new, new space, new ideas, new frameworks, new titles. Uh, we're really entering 2020 with a lot of optimism and enthusiasm and a lot of confidence about what we can do as a company and where we're going. And as we all know, the crisis hit. And just as everyone I'm sure on this call slash webinar happened overnight, we changed the way we work. We immediately went home and started working from home. We were on a technical level and physical level, it was a pretty easy transition for us. We have always worked off laptops. Most of our tools prior to COVID were in the cloud. Now they are all in the cloud. Um, so at that kind of level, it was easy, but at an emotional level, it was very difficult to make this change pretty much within 24 hours. So we leaned in very heavily to accepting our new reality, trying to find new tools that would help us. We use Slack a lot. That was, has been an excellent tool for us to that instant communication, feeling like we're together. Of course, we leaned in very heavily to Zoom and all the culture that Zoom brings with it. And just culturally, we did a lot to stay connected. Week over week, everything was changing, but we really tried to lean into staying together, creating opportunities for connection, and doing as much as we could, hoping it would be short term. But as we continued throughout 2020, we realized, I think we all realized, hey, this isn't changing. This is where we're going to be for a minute. And I do want to bring up that we have some polls, as we mentioned in the chat. So please look at those. And one of the ones we're asking here is, how do you respond to conflict? Because as you can see, our dog here is trying to ignore the conflict, the fire around him, as we were all trying to do, I think. But we realized, hey, this is going to be the new way we're going to be working for a while. We don't see an end in sight. What do we need to do to make sure we can stay on our path for exponential growth? That had not changed at all, even with the onset of COVID. Our goals as a company were still very much to move forward, con con continue to expand. So we realized a so few key people left, you know, within our great recession, we start to see some cracks around the org chart that maybe we haven't done as much communicating and hearing what people had to say around this. So we decided in early 2021 to conduct four internal strategic workshops and really investigate how we were doing as a company. So this all the groundwork was laid with an employee survey where we were able to suss out where are we doing well? Where do we need to improve? Um, and those, of course, informed our three workshops after the first workshop really kind of told the story and gave the information that we received. And overall, these were an amazing opportunity, actually, for us to connect and really see where we we're at. I will say a couple of things that made these workshops very successful is we can, first off, we included a physical component with every workshop. So we sent home to each person's house some sort of tie-in. So not only were we experiencing the workshops virtually together, there was actually a physical and tactile component that we all were also experiencing. And I strongly believe that really pushed 
the impact of these workshops much further than we could have done if we just only leaned in virtually. And also the second component that made these highly successful was the if some if the workshops that were most collaborative were the most successful. So the more we had breakout sessions, the more we allowed people just to brainstorm and tell us their ideas, the more we listened, the, the more successful they were. The least successful portions of these workshops were where we were pushing information at people and they were just kind of taking it in and hearing what we had to say. Um, so that I would really encourage everyone to think about that when you are running something like this, that the more that the business leadership can listen and not tell, the stronger the workshop will be and the more you'll get out of it. So as we dug down and people told us what they would like to see for the future, we realized to be successful on hitting those metrics, communication was the core to everything. We needed very strong ability to communicate across all platforms, interpersonally, uh, project teams, at all company meetings, and even just informationally when we're trying to, like we've been instituting, instituting a lot of standards over the last year. So if we can't communicate, you know, how we want people to work in what ways, we're falling down and we're not doing as much as we can. So, you know, we decided communication is core skill set. Also within this, the pandemic really opened our eyes to the blurriness between professional and personal like spaces. I was a strong believer for pretty much my entire career previous to COVID that those items should be kept separate, right? That there should be a line between our professional and personal lives. And honestly, like work should make you cry. And if it's making you cry, you know, you need to go take a walk kind of idea. I have really been changed on this idea. And it is because we all got brought into people's homes. We saw how people lived. We saw all the impacts, which we always knew were there, but it was no longer we could ignore it. And within that, we realized to be truly successful as a company, we had to be much more vulnerable, both as leaders, coworkers, peers. The more we can show as ourselves and really what we're thinking and feeling, the more people trust us, the more people will be honest with us, the greater our ability to hear what people are trying to tell us and make those changes that can allow us to succeed. So these were some big lessons for us as leaders about what we need to do and how we need to present ourselves and bring ourselves to the workplace to really create these frameworks to succeed. So, and this is just ever continuing. Uh, you know, we, it's been very exciting to bring in Janine and one of, as she mentioned, one of the things our population really wanted was a mentorship program, which highlighted how important it was for us to be able to communicate with each other. But just even at a broader scale, with our vision of growth and change, we need to be strong communicators about, hey, we're making, we're pivoting here. We see we need to make a we mean to make a change. That idea what we had a year ago, it's not going to work. We need to make, you know, really tell everyone, hey, we decided to go this direction. This is why these are the goals we're hoping to achieve. And I will say kind of using the org chart as an example, it has morphed from that picture of what we previously showed. We had to go back and say, hey, is the studio structure quite right given this current moment? People needed more support, not less support during the pandemic. So we did some consolidation around our studios and our leadership to provide that. And it was a smart move. We just had to really communicate around it. So moving into that, I wanna bring Janine in to speak to how we've utilized her amazing talents and kind of kick this off for Brick. And I'll let her introduce also another poll question that we've thrown up there. Thanks, Lynn. And as you can see, up until this point, 
Brick was doing a lot to think about how to be intentional with the growth of their business and how they wanted to position themselves going forward. You know, they didn't anticipate, of course, the pandemic and that radically shifted things and prompted a lot of necessary conversations uh, that I think a lot of architecture studios have had to face during during this time. Um, so when I came on board, the first thing that we talked about was that the team had actually asked for a mentorship program. They wanted more mentorship support. And parallel to that was a desire for more support around communications training and really learning what are communication skills and how could they practice them and get better at them. So our question in the poll is to ask you if you have a mentorship or communication program in your firm. Um, there's a couple options. You could have one, the other, both, or neither. And I can't see the answers, but I can't wait to hear how you guys vote. So just walking you through this process, um, I my business, I use a, a design approach, just very similar to the way that architects think about taking a client through building a project, but it's applied on the business. And my process starts with a discovery phase. And we actually went through a qualitative interview phase where I talked to about eight different people across the studio to understand what different people were thinking in regards to communication in the studio. All of this data um, was helpful in allowing me to pull out key themes that I was seeing and hearing and talk to the leadership team about those observations and findings. Together, we went through a concept development phase where you know, we came up with a preliminary concept, we refined it, we're still refining it, and we've moved through an, an initial um, kickoff phase with the mentorship program, and we're actually in a test drive right now, or what we're calling like a pilot phase, um, to, to test out these ideas with the desire to make improvements and make it better as we move forward. And I'll just add really quickly, we are investigating the program every moment. We want this to be very successful. So we're making adjustments right now. If someone's not comfortable, we're talking about it. We're helping them with prompts. We're really leaning in to make people feel comfortable. And I want to point to some of the key work that Brick did early on in identifying their values was really helpful to this work. Two of their values um, kind of have been at the forefront of how we've been thinking about the mentorship program. Um, number one being team. I love that they feel like we're in this together. Um, they want to bring out the best in every individual who's on their team. And they've written into the language that we respect and support each other. How powerful is that? Um, there's also the value of integrity um, and the idea that they want to set their colleagues up for success. So again, coming back to that idea of language in the studio, um, you know, articulating these values is so incredibly helpful. I, so we're going to talk about mentorship, but understand that it's in the context of communication. And I want to define mentorship because I know everybody has different perceptions about what it is. In this conversation, we have three components of this, the mentee, the mentor, and both. So the mentee is someone who wants to grow and is learning new skills. The mentor is a little bit more seasoned, has knowledge, and is um, able to share and teach those skills to someone else. And then, of course, at some points in our career, we're a little bit of both. So we've got that category also. When I started talking to Brick, I was showing them and talking to them about the traditional apprenticeship models that we've inherited in architecture. And this is, of course, is the traditional one-to-one -one relationship that I think everybody's familiar with, with the idea of the traditional mentor-mentee partnership. But I also pointed out that mentorship shows up in another way on our project teams and how we structure um, our teams in practice in the studio. And all of these relationships um, are opportunities for communication within the studio. Mentorship has other models too, and, and a couple of them include organic or peer models that occur. And I think everybody's familiar and has seen these. For example, when our emerging professionals get together in a professional way, like the AIA, and they come up with ideas about how to support other emerging professionals, or when our 
new um, project managers who've just been promoted get together to talk about the challenges of stepping into that new leadership role. And also there is um, the example of co-leadership, which Brick and I, I know a couple other firms that follow this model where senior leaders of the firm are actually working in partnership for the success of the business. When I studied uh, Brick's mentorship model that was happening, uh, I found that actually through the reorganization of the org chart that they had created this ladder model. Uh, and it's not necessarily about hierarchy. In fact, it's to, to be more intentional about moving past hierarchy and creating relationships that are actually happening at the project level where people are both reaching forward and reaching backward to mentor and pull people forward. The way that they're thinking about mentorship really creates this idea of a path within their business that allows people to envision where they're heading in their career and also to be accountable both as a mentor and mentee. At any point in their career, they can be that for somebody else, whether it's meeting with the person that's their um, mentee or their mentor. So we have a lot of relationships happening in the studio that we had to bring into focus to help the team recognize the opportunity for team collaboration and mentorship. So the, the latter model is happening in a very formal way within the studio, but what we've also recognized is that there are parallel informal systems happening. At the time that we did our qualitative research, there was a group of new hires that had rallied together behind the scenes to support each other in an onboarding process complementary to the way that the firm was onboarding them. So these informal structures are happening behind the scenes. Um, there were also informal structures that were happening through the many workshops that Brick was investing in to bring everybody together, um, where everyone could come and, and talk through different challenges. And at the time, there were a lot of conversations happening about diversity and inclusion. So key things that we heard from the team, um, they, they felt like the firm had a really great culture and that it was supportive. They recognized that their leadership team was interested in doing it better than what the traditional practice of architecture model looks like. They were looking for new ways to do it. And so the team recognized value in that. We also, I mean, if you meet the brick team, you'll see that they're just a great group of people. So there was a lot of, um, potential just in the people that they had hired. What I heard in the conversations pointed to common challenges that I hear across all of my clients and across a lot of the architects that I talk to right now. This point of pressure that everyone's experiencing on the project demands that they're trying to navigate up against very rigorous time constraints. Um, some of the participants indicated that they weren't sure really about mentorship foundations, that they felt comfortable being a mentee, but they weren't really sure how to be a mentor or what they were supposed to be doing. And then, of course, there's the individual accountability piece. Um, but ultimately, I think what it came down to is that they just were looking for more support and guidance on how to do this and how to do it effectively. We designed solutions to help support the studio, including different tools and resources. Um, so in this slide is an example, and this, these are communication tools. So I know we're talking about mentorship, but I wanna make the point that mentorship and communication inside the studio are really directly related. Um, but this tool was about helping to orient people into that first conversation that you have where you're supposed to set up your mentor-mentee relationship and decide how you guys are gonna work together. Um, Sometimes people don't know what to talk about. And I think a really important thing to cover is to set expectations early in those relationships. So this worksheet demonstrates a few metrics and responsibilities. It's really a series of prompt questions to get people thinking about what they want their dynamic to look like. We also went through a really cool surveying process where we pulled everybody in the office to figure out where they saw their strengths, where did they see themselves as a mentor or a mentee, or where were things where they had that um, in-between uh, role of both. 
and we ask them to identify the things that they would be most interested in mentoring on. Now the names on the slide have been changed and uh, the data has been altered, but you can see that it's a pretty powerful graphic um, when you want to think about mentoring across the studio in informal settings. This is really like a quick reference guide, especially like if you're dealing with a new person on your team, you can quickly see if they feel like they're and they have a strength in technical proficiency, or if they, um, you know, are working on their ARES, if that's like a primary focus for them. Um, it just gives everybody a layer of transparency um, that helps them understand where people stand on different things. So I felt like this was one of the coolest things that we've designed yet in, in a custom mentorship program. And I, and I think the team found a lot of value in it too, just to see how everybody identified themselves. So the parallel part about the mentorship program that relates to communication is that we have designed a communication series. In fact, Brick's so committed to this that we're spending 12 months on it. Um, it started in January and it's, it's a parallel program that's about skills building in relationship to the mentorship program. So we started with a workshop in January where we did a lot of self-assessment work. I've asked the participants to think about their individual strengths, weaknesses, challenges, and the opportunities that they, they want to um, implement over the next several months towards growth. Key topics we're going to be training on is, include team communication, communication channels at BRIC, interpersonal skills, external communication, and navigating common challenges. So you may be asking yourself, what are those common challenges? And what I've heard from many of my clients is the one-to-one -one feedback is really difficult in the studio environment. Tough conversations are something that everybody typically doesn't want to have to deal with. Um, I also hear about architects who are struggling with delegating um, or managing conflicting priorities. And of course, that time and pressure on projects is really hard. So we're going to be talking about all of that this year. And we're opening up conversations that you can see, like we are being very transparent, even in this conversation, we're talking about how stress and anxiety impact um, and create barriers to communication or the culture of busyness, um, the, the quantity of things that we have in our inbox. Um, and also like, people's mental filters that prevent them from hearing and receiving information. Um, I'm going to pass through this because I want to get to our Q&A, but as you can see, there's quite a few things that you have to navigate when you're thinking about communication. Um, there's an input-output that you have to consider in terms of how other people receive information and how you receive and deliver information. The 12 month series looks a little bit like this. So you can see we're doing, we're just in the first quarter, but we have one month on with the workshop, one month off where we do a actual skills building um, group activity. In February, it was an improv class, which was highly successful. I highly recommend that. And believe it or not, you can do it over Zoom, um, but it basically breaks down the barriers that make people feel unsure about communication. And we're about to get into some really meaty topics about team communication and the challenges that we face when we're trying to navigate the studio environment. So key lessons I wanna end on with this before we jump into the Q&A. The first thing when you're thinking about communications inside the studio is that you have to have um, the ability to identify and daylight the challenges. And that's where having a third party person come in to help you see some of those challenges objectively is really helpful. Um, it's actually through that process that we're able to design a tailored solution that meets the actual needs of the people in the studio environment. Number two, we've designed and provided resources and ongoing support. So all of these um, items that I've shown you very quickly, they add up to a compounded effect that are around providing support on intentional conversations with mentorship and communication. And um, we're still trying to figure it out, but I think you can't just expect mentorship to happen the way it used to 
in um, traditional firm settings where it's just organic or it's just gonna be whenever in between project deadlines. Um, I think that the new way that we're shifting towards thinking about practice is to be very intentional and is to put support behind some of those conversations. And the third thing is just that we have recognized across this entire studio that we need to be practicing these skills together. Um, that it's not any one individual person's um, deficiency, it's that collectively we're raising the bar. Everyone can improve on communications. And if we practice it together, it's not as um, challenging. You know, we come together as a team to really be able to talk about the hard stuff. So with that, we wanted to jump into the Q&A and see if you guys had any questions. I know we skipped through some stuff pretty quickly. <laughs> and I'll just say, um, yeah, I, that just kind of to end up really quickly that I'm going to be participating in the career fair. So please like hop over tomorrow and check me out. But the whole like idea of the practice and just, I strongly believe that, you know, even small incremental improvements around communication can have huge impacts. So don't get so caught up in someone going from like a terrible communicator to an amazing communicator. That's not what needs to happen. It just needs to be small improvements, that ability to listen better, that ability to take a breath before you say something. Those are the things we're looking for and that someone can build upon. And I'll just say, I'm gonna see, I see some questions coming up. One of them is um, loving the flexibility of changing your team structure based on different situations. Do you think that will be hard to scale for the future? And actually, I want to say no. This is a very important part of how our org chart was developed and how we are going to keep refining it is very much making sure it can grow exponentially, that it does allow us that flexibility. So it's been interesting to not feel, you know, not to create something that is like has hard, you know, boundaries. It's actually something very different where we can be more fluid and flexible when the situation arises. Mm -hmm. I think oh. you're muted, at least for me, Joanne. Okay, I got it. I need to, <laughs> I do it every single time. <laughs> and the host. Um, <laughs> all right, I think we can also look at the poll results from the poll you did earlier. So you had a question, do you have a mentorship or communication program? Most people, 57% have said neither. Mm -hmm. So they don't have a mentorship or communication program. 26% said mentorship. Um, and 4% said communication, 13% said both. So I think it's not surprising to see that a, a lot of architecture firms don't have a mentorship or communication program. What advice would, do you have for people who are just starting who wants to implement either of those programs? Mm. Janine, I'll let you speak to that. <laughs> yeah, I did some early research on this topic, and it's shocking how many firms don't have mentorship programs. I think the most important place is to start talking about what, what you want it to look like inside your firm and to have that conversation with your partners to see if they would be open to it. It can be as simple as just a small group of emerging professionals getting together and championing it. But also, if you can get that firm uh, partner buy-in, that's even better because you can actually scale it up to support the entire studio. And it doesn't have to become a soloed piece um, off to the side. If you think about it in the context like Brick is, it's integral to your business. Um, it's actually a really powerful tool to um, enhance your business. And I'll just add to that. Um you know, as much as everybody wanted mentoring, there was a lot of fear around it right? Because people not feeling confident about how to have difficult conversations and what, how do I exactly do this? And definitely anyone feeling, you know, putting in that mentor position. A lot of people are used to being the mentee and being mentored, but it feels a lot different when you're getting asked to be the person who's kind of guiding someone along. So that's when we realized we need to kind of create the skill set that allows mentorship to succeed. 
Um, that's very important to us. And I wanted to speak to another poll question. The first one we uh, did, just how many hours do you feel you lose to miscommunication uh, each month? I don't know exactly what the results were on that one, but I will say throughout my career, I feel very strongly that business over um, like puts too much value on technical skill and not enough value on these soft skills, these cultural skills. Because you can say someone is an, oh, they're an amazing earner. They bring in so much business. But if they've created a level of drama at your office that causes 20 people to lose a full day of pr you know, production work, you should think about all the money they just lost you. There is a trade-off that you're not really keying into. And even myself, when I have to continually work with certain individuals about their communication skills or kind of something they might have caused within the studio that now we have to deal with, it negates a lot of this supposed idea that they're so you know helpful to the company. Because I've then had to spend a lot of time, I'm having to help all these other people get, you know, get feel more calm, get around the person again, get more in line with the ideas we're trying to, you know, the pro work we're trying to get done. So I think it's very important to investigate really who is a quality person adding value to your company. Because it's not just people who bring in the hard dollars and cents. It's the people who are creating the situations that allow everyone to do that. Because then you can, you know, deliver on scale. One person can only take you so far, but 20 plus people can take you very, very far if you're all working in the same direction. Yeah, I love that. I think that's also like the quality of a leader when mm -hmm. most people think of their leader as people that are earning the most profits for the firm, but it's really, to me, a leader is someone that can take other people and make the best of them and lead them to a common goal. There was another just quick question. Um, I think Trevor was asking, do you have a great example of how communication changed in Brick through this process? Do you want to throw one out there, Janine, or I could throw something? Yeah, go for it. You probably are seeing it more closely. Well, I see it a lot, and honestly, I'm experiencing it a lot. I'll use myself as an example. I consider my, you know, myself a very high-level communication person uh, previous to our program and you know, previous to all this. And it's really pushed me to be a better communicator, which I think is something everyone should realize, even if you think you're good at something, we can all improve. That's what I'm talking about, incremental improvements. I can do better. I can be more thoughtful. Most importantly, I can listen more. I think that's something all of us are realizing. The listening component of the communication dynamic is very important and huge. Like if you're not listening, you're not actually participating well within your communication with someone. You have to take that moment, not be thinking ahead, not thinking about what you're going to say next. Be present. Listen to what the person's saying. And you can always take a beat before you answer. You know, it's like this whole idea that you instantly need to know what to say. Lean out from that. Take a moment. Give yourself an opportunity to really think deeply about what you want to say. Embrace the silence. <laughs> yes, it's hard, right? To have yeah, that it's hard. You know, few seconds of uncomfortableness, but... That's good to like live in that um, for a bit and then move on because that's what real conversations are about, having uncomfortable moments and then navigating yourself through them. Thank you. So thank you, Jenny and Lynn. This was a great conversation on communications and I think we all learned a lot from it. Thank you so much for joining today and I will see you soon. Mm -hmm.